Welcome to this video on presbyacusis. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is presbyacusis and what are the four types? How does degeneration in different parts of the auditory system manifest on audiometry? What is dynamic range and how does this affect a patient's ability to tolerate hearing aids? And what are the main options to treat presbyacusis? Presbyacusis is the age-related loss of hearing, typically affecting both ears symmetrically. It is one of the most common sensory impairments in the elderly, often developing gradually over several years. Presbyacusis predominantly affects the higher frequencies and is caused by the cumulative effect of aging on the auditory system. The exact pathophysiology is multifactorial and can be attributed to degeneration of the cochlear hair cells, changes in the stria vascularis, and degeneration of the spiral ganglion neurons, along with changes to the basilar membrane of the cochlea. Patients with presbyacusis typically present with gradual onset hearing loss, with difficulty hearing in noisy environments. They may struggle with high-pitched sounds, and they may develop tinnitus. Importantly, the patients may present with social withdrawal, and avoid social situations because they struggle to follow conversations. This can lead to isolation and depression, and there is a strong relationship between hearing loss and cognitive decline. Harold Schucknecht classified presbyacusis into four different distinct types based on histopathological findings. Each type reflects damage in different parts of the auditory system. These include sensory presbyacusis affecting the outer hair cells, neural presbyacusis affecting the spiral ganglion neurons, striel or metabolic presbyacusis affecting the stria vascularis, and cochlear conductive presbyacusis affecting the basilar membrane of the cochlear duct. With sensory presbyacusis, predominantly the outer hair cells are degenerated over time. This results in loss of the preamplification function, making it more difficult for the inner hair cells to detect vibrations. The hair cells in the basal turn of the cochlea are closest to the oval window and so are more exposed to higher amplitude sounds than cells at the middle and apical turns. As such, these tend to degenerate sooner, resulting in a high frequency loss. On an audiogram, this results in a ski slope loss typical of a sensory presbyacusis. However, as the spiral ganglion cells remain intact, speech discrimination is still maintained. By contrast, with neural presbyacusis, there is a loss of spiral ganglion neurons which transmit the auditory signals to the brain via the cochlear nerve. This results in reduced speech discrimination that is out of proportion with the patient's overall hearing levels and a down-slanting audiogram is typically seen. With striel or metabolic presbyacusis, the stria vascularis, which is usually responsible for maintaining the ionic composition of the endolymph, becomes dysfunctional, leading to a broad gradual loss across all frequencies. These patients typically retain good speech discrimination but have a significant degree of hearing loss across all frequencies. Finally, with cochlear conductive presbyacusis, the physical properties of the cochlear duct's basilar membrane become stiffer with age, reducing the ability of the cochlea to transmit sound vibrations effectively. The tonotopic arrangement of the cochlea is achieved by the basilar membrane having different stiffness throughout. As such, depending upon whether the basilar membrane becomes stiffer or floppier due to age-related changes, certain frequencies will be affected more than others. Another feature typical of sensory presbyacusis is a reduction in the dynamic range. The dynamic range is the difference between hearing thresholds, the softer sound that can be detected, and the uncomfortable loudness level, the loudest sound that can be tolerated. In presbyacusis, the hearing threshold rises due to hearing loss, while the uncomfortable loudness level reduces. This narrows the dynamic range, meaning that as sounds go from quiet to moderately loud, they are perceived as uncomfortably loud much more quickly than in individuals without hearing loss. This is why a hearing aid must be carefully programmed to ensure patient compliance. The loss of dynamic range is due to loss of outer hair cells in the cochlea. These ordinarily amplify soft sounds and enhance sound sensitivity. However, in presbyacusis, as these cells are progressively lost, there is a reduction in sensitivity to quiet sounds. However, when sounds are louder and reach a certain level, the inner hair cells still function, but without the fine-tuning provided by the outer hair cells. This creates a sharp increase in the perceived loudness for moderate sounds. 
This is exacerbated by disinhibition of the central auditory pathways, known as central gain, as a consequence of reduced hearing. Although there is currently no cure for presbycusis, there are several treatment options that can help manage the condition and improve a patient's quality of life. These include conventional hearing aids, which are the most common treatment. Hearing aids can be programmed to amplify specific frequencies matched to the patient's audiometric thresholds. They can be combined with assistive listening devices, such as FM systems, which couple directly with the patient's hearing aid, enabling them to hear better in specific situations like crowded environments by transmitting sound directly from a source to the listener. For those with profound hearing loss not benefiting from hearing aids, cochlear implants are an option. These devices bypass the damaged portions of the ear and directly stimulate the auditory nerve. However, in cases of advanced neural presbycusis, if the spiral ganglion cells in a particular region of the cochlea have degenerated, cochlear implant electrodes targeting that region may be ineffective because there are no functional neurons to stimulate. This may impair the hearing performance despite implantation. Finally, any patient that requires devices to enable hearing should also be counseled for safety equipment to help them to detect danger when they don't have the implants in. These involve fire detection systems which include lights or tactile feedback through a vibrating pillow which are activated in response to smoke. I hope you found this video to be useful. I'd be grateful for your feedback in the comment section below and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.